Hello, and welcome to Killer Bites, a show where we talk all things crime while making a delicious recipe. Crime and food seem like a strange pairing, but think of it as a perfect combination of salty and sweet. Today on Killer Bites, I'm gonna tell you about Agatha Christie's bizarre disappearance while making a chicken and waffle breakfast sandwich. If you find yourself craving the same thing, the recipe is in the description below. Months after the famous crime novelist Agatha Christie finished her book titled The Murder of Roger Ackroyd, she vanished. The circumstances of her disappearance were very peculiar. Thousands of people searched for her, some performed seances, and one man even hired a psychic to help track down Agatha. But 11 days later, she resurfaced with no recollection of what happened or who she was. What the heck happened? On the night of December 3rd, 1926, 36-year-old Agatha Christie kissed her daughter goodnight and wrote a letter for her secretary saying she wouldn't be coming back home that night. Then she walked out of her Sunningdale, England home with just a briefcase in hand and drove off in her Morris Crowley. At 8 a.m. the following morning, Agatha's car was found crashed and abandoned on the edge of a chalk pit several miles away from her home. It was positioned in between some bushes with the headlights still on. The wheels were literally hanging over a cliff, and her briefcase was still inside. At first, it seemed like Agatha could have just gotten in a crash, but she was nowhere to be found. You'd think she'd still be in the car or immediately find help or something. The whole setup was very peculiar, and there were no clues that suggested where Agatha went. Did she run away? Was she abducted? It was all a mystery. So I'm gonna start by putting my vegan chicken cutlets in the oven. A huge search for Agatha began, and over the next couple of days, the story of Agatha's disappearance started to circulate far and wide. It was even published on the cover of the New York Times on December 6th. As I mentioned earlier, Agatha was an extremely famous crime novelist. How crazy is it that someone who writes about crimes goes missing in a very crime-like way? You know what they say, life imitates art. While investigators were searching for evidence and interviewing Agatha's friends and family, civilians and other crime novelists were coming up with theories of their own. Some people believed Agatha was snuffed by her husband. Others thought she accidentally or intentionally drowned in the nearby pond and a handful of people thought this was a publicity stunt to build clout for her newest book. OMG, that would be super extra, but you gotta do what you gotta do. The search for Agatha was massive. Thousands of police officers and concerned volunteers spent hours upon hours looking for her. And on December 8th, there was a break in the case. Agatha's brother-in-law received a letter in the mail from her saying she was going to a Yorkshire spa for rest and treatment. Please don't tell me this girl took an impromptu vacay and made the whole world think something terrible happened to her. So now I'm gonna mix my waffle mix and water. Once the authorities were informed of the note, they called off the investigation. But when two days passed and people still hadn't heard a peep from Agatha, the investigation was started right back up again. Police officers took Agatha's dog over by where her car was found to see if it would be able to track her scent. It was worth a shot, but the dog ended up just whining and proved to be no help at all. Wait, I love how the detectives just took her dog out to the scene thinking it would be this pro search dog. Don't they have a special canine unit for that? At this point, investigators were desperate to find Agatha, that they entertained whatever lead or theory they caught a whiff of. So when the theory about Agatha purposefully sinking to the bottom of the pond started to spread, officials decided to dredge the Silent Pool, which was a natural pond in the area. According to local legend, the Silent Pool was bottomless. But when the authorities dredged the pond, Agatha wasn't there. And I guess the myth was busted that the silent pool was bottomless too? Another belief was that Agatha's house was haunted and that had something to do with her vanishing. Apparently Agatha once told her friend, if I do not leave Sunningdale soon, Sunningdale will be the end of me. But how would that explain her driving off and disappearing? Ooh, maybe a ghost is involved. 
When it was about a week into the investigation and officials were still unable to track down any witnesses, they started to lose hope. The only real clues they had to go off of were three letters from Agatha. The one she left her secretary, the one she left her brother-in-law, and one she sent her husband. But her husband wouldn't say what Agatha wrote to him. He just said it was a personal note. So Agatha's marriage was a hot mess as of late because her husband had been cheating on her, which led a lot of people to believe he had something to do with her going missing. Agatha first met Archibald or Archie Christie at a local dance in 1912. At the time, she was 22 years old. In 1914, Archie was sent to France for World War I, but he returned later that year and married Agatha. They bounced around the London area for several years until settling down in Sunningdale and having a daughter, Rosalind, who was named after the heroine from Shakespeare's As You Like It. Somewhere along the way, Agatha and Archie started experiencing issues in their marriage. Supposedly, money was one of the common points of tension. Classic. Well, Archie decided that instead of facing his marital problems face on, he would start hooking up with his 25-year-old secretary, Nancy Neal. Archie later decided that he wanted to divorce Agatha. He told her right around the time her mother passed away from bronchitis, so the timing wasn't ideal. Before Agatha drove off the last night she was seen, she and Archie apparently got in a big blow-up fight that ended in him packing some of his things for a weekend away with his friends and secretary turned mistress. I guess I should've led with that information, huh? Nah, I gotta keep you on your toes. And this was also the same order investigators started discovering all of this. Obviously, Archie and Nancy seemed super suspicious at this point, but like most of the search thus far, there were no witnesses, leads, or evidence. Detectives couldn't really entertain the theory that the cheating husband or mistress was responsible without more information. On December 13th, a huge group of 10,000 to 15,000 people joined in another hunt for Agatha. This time, cops brought six trained bloodhounds instead of Agatha's household dog. That same day, the police suspected Agatha was somewhere in London, disguised, and probably in male attire. Not sure what spurred this theory, but there had to be something if the cops said this. Meanwhile, spiritualists were holding a seance at the chalk pit where Agatha's car was found. And Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, aka the mystery writer who created Sherlock Holmes, hired a psychic to try and find Agatha using her glove as a guide. The following day, it was reported in the newspaper that detectives found the following items near the pit a bottle labeled poison lead and opium, torn up postcard pieces, a woman's coat, face powder, two children's books, a cardboard box, and the end of a bread loaf. How's that for a random combination of items? As the search continued, it really started to seem like Agatha was deceased. One newspaper even reported the police have information which they refuse to divulge and which leads them to the view that Mrs. Christie had no intention of returning when she left home. But just one day after that was published, Agatha was found alive and healthy. Say what? The head waiter at the hydropathic hotel in Harrogate, Yorkshire, reached out to the police saying there was a super outgoing guest who went by the name Teresa Neal and spoke in a South African accent. This waiter suspected Teresa was actually Agatha in disguise. It's not clear what the reasoning was behind this theory, but it was super sketchy that Teresa had the same last name as Archie's mistress, Nancy Neal. After being tipped off by the waiter, a set of investigators went to the hotel with Archie to see if this woman really was Agatha. They sat down in the dining room and waited for a bit before Teresa walked in. It was definitely Agatha. She sat down at another table and began reading a newspaper that had the story of her own disappearance on the front cover. That's kind of weird. Maybe she just liked the attention? Well, Archie went up to his wife, and she apparently just gave him this blank stare and didn't recognize him at all. Agatha was completely convinced she was Teresa Neal. She had no idea her real identity was Agatha Christie, had no recollection of anything, 
and couldn't tell the difference between reality and imagination. Archie tried to get Agatha to come home with him, but reports say she was in no hurry to leave. She finally agreed to go with Archie, but decided to change into an evening gown for whatever reason. Nosy people and wannabe detectives swarm the train station to see the resolution to the insane mystery as Agatha and Archie headed home. But even though the disappearance was solved, there were many questions that puzzled people everywhere. What the heck happened? Why did Agatha leave in the first place? How did the car crash happen? What were the letters all about? And why did she disguise herself? Archie told reporters, the doctors told me such an action was compatible with that of a person suffering from loss of memory. She does not know who she is. She has suffered from the most complete loss of memory. The only time Agatha ever spoke about the incident was in an interview she did with the Daily Mail. As she was driving past the quarry one day, she said, there came into my mind the thought of driving into it. However, as my daughter was with me in the car, I dismissed the idea at once. That night, I felt terribly miserable. I felt that I could go on no longer. I left home that night in a state of high nervous strain with the intention of doing something desperate. When I reached a point on the road, which I thought was near the quarry, I turned the car off the road down the hill toward it. I left the wheel and let the car run. The car struck something with a jerk and pulled up suddenly. I was flung against the steering wheel and my head hit something. Up to this moment, I was Mrs. Christie. That's all Agatha would ever say. She claimed to have suffered from amnesia and didn't recall checking into the hotel. She wouldn't even talk about the situation with her friends. It was one of those things not on the table for discussion. Kind of like my ex-boyfriend at holiday gatherings. I feel you, Aggie girl. In March of 1928, which was a little over a year from the incident, Agatha sued Archie for divorce. One month later, the divorce was finalized. Agatha was in a really bad headspace after her mother's passing, divorce from Archie, and probably all of the people pestering her about her disappearance, so she traveled out of the country to heal. She went to Iraq, where she met an archaeologist named Max. They hit it off, and in 1930, got married in Edinburgh. Aw, good for her. She deserves it. Archie got married to Nancy, too, but he sealed the deal before his and Agatha's divorce was even finalized. Jerkwad. Aside from one interview in 1928, Agatha never spoke of her disappearance ever again. She continued to write books and plays as her popularity soared through the roof. Agatha earned and still holds the title of the best-selling novelist of all time. She also got super into surfing and is recognized as the first woman to bring worldwide attention to the sport. On January 12, 1976, Agatha took her last breath. She was 85 years old. One year later, her autobiography was published. In her writings, Agatha never addressed the 11-day period where she vanished off the face of the earth and thousands of people searched for her. She barely even touched on her marriage with Archie. All Agatha wrote about that was, there's no need to dwell on it. But even though Agatha never spilled the tea on what happened back in 1926, many psychologists, writers, and crime junkies ideated theories of their own. The most popular theory is that Agatha suffered a medical condition known as fugue state, or a period of out-of-body amnesia induced by stress. You know, I think I might have that. I'm always stressed and confused. A biographer and former doctor named Andrew Norman published a study on Agatha Christie's life using medical case studies to back up this theory. He elaborated that Agatha was in a psychogenic trance brought on by trauma or depression, and Agatha had plenty of that going on in her life. Andrew even expressed his opinion that Agatha had dark thoughts about ending her life. He proved this idea by saying, her state of mind was very low, and she writes about it later through the character of Celia in her autobiographical novel, Unfinished Portrait. Some people believed Agatha's mother's demise was the catalyst of the incident. Others believe it was Archie bringing up the divorce. As for me, 
I think it's a combination of the two. Andrew concluded Agatha's lack of memory and her made-up Teresa character were all a part of this amnesia. All right, now I'm gonna assemble my chicken and waffle sandwich. But another theory claimed the disappearance was thought up by Agatha to punish her cheating husband. The primary reasoning behind this theory is the last name Agatha chose to check in at the hotel under. Yeah, I have a hard time believing that was a coincidence. The last main theory built on Andrew's opinion was that Agatha was contemplative of her life. Maybe she tried to end her life that day, but got scared when she drove up to the edge of the chalk pit. But then why would she go undercover? Did she change her mind and plan to live under a new identity entirely? One of the most ironic parts about all of this is that Agatha's crime novels always came to a resolution. No matter how insane the plot was, Agatha would always bring it to a satisfying resolution and no questions went unanswered. The editor-in-chief of Vanity Fair remarked Agatha was great at capturing something elemental about mysteries. That motive and opportunity may suffice for a crime, but the satisfying part is the detective's revelation of who done it, how, and why. But when it comes to her real life mystery, she leaves her fans dumbfounded? Dang, I'm starting to think this really was a publicity stunt. Honestly though, Agatha's writing would have been famous with or without the media frenzy of her vanishing. By the end of her career, she had written 66 crime novels and 14 short story collections. She paved the way for crime writers, women, and I guess surfers all over the world. So now that you've heard the story of Agatha Christie, what do you think happened? I think the amnesia theory makes the most sense, but the mistress last name thing throws me off. I just don't understand how so many days passed without anyone knowing anything. To stop me from asking any more questions, I'm gonna take a bite of this chicken and waffle breakfast sandwich and give my brain a rest. See you next time.